Uh, it is wonderful to have you all here this evening. It is wonderful to have Jean Beck here. Uh, she has made quite a splash with this book in terms of North Korea's hidden revolution, looking at information and what it is doing to transform North Korea. Uh, and we will have a nice chat here and then turn to your questions. I did want to mention that uh, I had the great opportunity to meet Ms. Beck up at Harvard University at a celebration of the Kim Koo Foundation's support for the Korea Institute there. Uh, the Kim Koo Foundation had just generously also committed a million dollars to the Korea Society for the stand-up of a professional series. And we are now concluding our second year of that series, and we're very grateful to the society, uh, to the uh, Kim Koo Foundation for its support, and all great things collide, so it was nice to have met you at that. It's very nice to have you here at the society and uh, to celebrate your release of this work, uh, which just came out uh, less than a month ago. Uh, June is a uh, PhD candidate in public policy at Oxford University and was previously at the Belfer Center at Harvard University and worked at Google as well. And I should note that you'll be appearing at Google uh, headquarters on January 10th in the new year. So for those who are listening and who happen to be in the West Coast area, uh, you'll have a chance to see her uh, as well. Uh, and she's spoken on Korea for NPR, for Al Jazeera, and for a host of other media outlets. So thank you for this and congratulations on the release. Great to have you here at the Korea thank Society. Thank you, thank you. Am I, am I using this mic correctly? You are indeed, okay, much like a K-pop star or <laughs> uh, a discussant of, of uh, policy events. Uh, this is the conclusion <clears throat> of the Korea Society's uh, policy season, and I think it's an important note to conclude on. Yesterday we had Ambassador Robert Gallucci, Dr. Victor Cha in the morning on advising the next U.S. president. At noon we had James Church here with the release of his last Inspector O novel, which also has some serious things to say about North Korea about mm -hmm. the issue of nuclear weapons development, about the transfer of, and he does that in entertaining ways, but with serious undertones. Uh, yours is a fascinating book that's important. Uh, it fills a void and takes a new approach in some different ways. Uh, I guess first off, one of the things that grabs the reader is you present a map of the Korean division, and while it shows the North-South division, it also uh, very creatively shows a lot of the regional divisions in Korea. Mm -hmm. And I think one of your messages uh, is that Korea is a multi-layered, complicated place, and that extends to North Korea. And it is not a monolith, as some people have observed and right. argue. So please, why don't we take that as a starting point for discussing the book and your approach? Sure. So you're noting the map. Um, and in the front page, the first page of the book. It was, uh, I worked with a cartographer at Harvard. I didn't know there was a full-time cartographer who provided such support. Uh, but Mr. Walker and I, so I wanted him to just come up with a map of the peninsula, thinking it was going to be an easy thing because I couldn't afford some of the maps from National Geographic and whatnot. And he said, sure, what cities should I grab? And I said, um, any cities that have, I don't know, over 100,000 people. and um, and in North Korea, he, he, we did multiple iterations of this map. And he said, I can't, no matter what software I use, I just can't figure out. Um, he, he struggled with basically the, the, um, the shrouded nature of such simple information such as population data. And so that was, um, that, the map alone was a um, culmination of a long project, actually. And so I think, like you mentioned, the, the country, of course, North Korea, is a very multi-layered. But I think what I try to do with the book is to bifurcate the, re the regime, the leadership, and its people. And I try to focus mostly on what I thought I could speak um, best to, which was uh, pockets of the citizenry. And so a lot of the voices that you hear in the book are of um, a lot of recent defectors, as well as people who've escaped decades ago. And um, even with the interviews that I've included in the book and a lot of secondary sources that I, that I, I worked into, um, you just hear so much diversity, not just in people's experiences, but their views, of course, um, like any other place. There's just, it's a place comprising such diverse um, backgrounds and opinions and political affiliations and so forth. And so I hope that that diversity was 
somewhat captured in the book through the no, map as well as the interviews. And, 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 and you do that in, in wonderful ways. And I think, think authors who, who jump in and talk about the complexity of places who, that have been described as a black box our people view as a monolith uh, is extremely valuable. And so you've done that with the refugees. You've done that uh, in your site visits, uh, too. But um, if you could talk a bit about uh, how you see things shifting. On page 239, toward the end, you have a wonderful quote that I actually happened to use a generation ago to start my doctoral dissertation, which was done out of Harvard. And the quote is that in 10 years, even the mountains move, an old mm -hmm. Korean proverb. And so I think what you're suggesting is that we do have some pretty fundamental changes taking place uh, that are led primarily by uh, the force of information right. and that information is getting in. Sure. Uh, I think the young generation, some people refer to them as Changmadang generation, the North Korean millennials, but essentially people who were born um, maybe a couple years after myself, so during the 1990s, during the Great Famine and after, they generally have access, unprecedented access to markets and unprecedented levels of foreign information that's flowing increasingly, um, increasingly flowing into the country through covert means run by NGOs and other kind of private citizen activities. And so the, talking to a lot of young North Korean people, uh, people of North Korean origin, it's phenomenal how they describe just their cities. I think one of the, one of, um, I think Chunhee's, Chunhee's the guy who told me, I said, describe your city, describe Hezan for me. And he said, I don't know, it's, it's just a regular market city. It's just a regular North Korean market city. And the way that he and so many of his age cohort kind of so nonchalantly was like, it's just a big market city. It was phenomenal, it was so interesting to see how people that I met from those cities who escaped years pr prior uh, described in such different ways. Um, and so young people, their views on what sources they depend on for food and support, what type of relationship they have with the state before leaving North Korea is just a tr is, is tremendously divergent from the older generation. Uh, and, and there's a lot of, there's so much material and a lot more um, interviews and documentary that cover this phenomenon. Uh, but I wanted to make sure I cover, I also include that part in the book as well. I think that with, with the information coming into uh, North Korea, there's obviously different types of content being pushed in uh, based on different types of demands. And so a lot of it is very entertainment driven. And so we, um, so there's of course K-pop and there's K-dramas and movies and all this stuff going in that, that there's a huge demand for, a growing demand for. But also a lot of the radio programs that are uh, secretly streamed in as well, not streamed, but broadcast into North Korea, um, they cover much more educational, more political, more civic um, material that is of course seen, seen as much more subversive from the state, but different demands, uh, different demands are met by different types of content, and um, they're triggering all sorts of small changes across the society. Mm -hmm. And when you talk, if you could describe for the audience and for the listeners and viewers uh, the range of information sources that North Koreans have available to them. Sure. So I want to iterate to uh, just listeners, that the, the foreign information that people are accessing is, of course, very risky for people to consume. It's all, it's all illegal. Any unauthorized access, consumption, possession, circulation of, uh, of uh, foreign information is highly punishable. So with that said, um, the demand is growing. And the, the demand for what? So the content ranges from, again, entertainment to um, a lot of unique content that NGOs are creating and crafting for North Korean consumers. So it could be something as seemingly ordinary as um, Mr. Kim Hong Gwang taking his cell phone across eMart, sort of the South Korean um, Walmart, if you will, and just grabbing, just creating, uh, just, just capturing video footage of the sheer volume of options people have as consumers and then narrating that back in his office, crap, putting that into different USBs and sending it in. Um, it could be radio dramas that um, organizations like Chisongo's organization is creating where uh, they're trying to 
integrate into the radio drama script principles of uh, supply and demand, business principles, as well as a lot of uh, basic human rights, civics, um, content that's kind of woven into the dialogue of these dramas. So, so there's original content that a lot of NGOs are crafting for North Korean listeners. Um, and then a lot of news, a lot of news about the outside world, but of course, uh, news about North Korea. So there's a lot of North Korean news that are that's being some um, that's being captured sometimes by stringers, sometimes by a lot of uh, really kind of underground journalist efforts and taken out of the country, repackaged, edited, and pushed back into North Korea. Um, some, a lot of the content there that people are interested in uh, seems to be prices, commodity prices on different, in markets across the country, weather, things like this. And so that's the content side. The way it's getting in, of course, there's different types of storage devices. So DVDs may be less in vogue these days, but definitely was a big uh, source of Con, uh, content before. So DVDs, um, often now, nowadays, USBs, micro SD chips, um, the tiny micro SD chips that may be the size of our fingernails, and then um, radio, of course. And some people have told me that they they were able to access um, television closer to the border, South Korean television and Chinese television, um, but I think that seems to be less common. Mm -hmm. And yeah, so content, way, methods of how they listen and access to this, access information. Yeah, and it seems that with these, these transitions in technology from, from VCD to, to USB drive and, and now to the micro drives, and mm -hmm. there was something just this weekend that appeared on the popularity of, of the micro uh, devices uh, for the reason you mentioned, the fact that they can be sewn into the lining of a jacket or, or easily transmitted or easily hidden from authorities. Right. Uh, or destroyed. Have, or destroyed. Right. Have, have the newest uh, appeal. Uh, and that implies a certain level of uh, adaptability, uh, a certain level of vibrancy in terms of the way information is, is passed and, and conveyed and shared. Uh, did you want to talk about that sharing aspect? Because I, I think you point out there's sort of a high-tech, low-tech dynamic, and, and word of mouth and the sharing and the social interaction seems to be a tremendous aspect of what drives this as well. Sure. So the greatest source of information that people, that I've come across, people telling me that they depend on is word of mouth. So in any close, any close society, this is the case. People trust information that comes from who they trust. So whether it's family, friends, um, classmates, or whatever else, people who they trust. But aside from that, so, so based on that trust element, um, I have, so many people have independently told me that once they purchase something on the market, um, they want to share, they're dying to tell or share it with somebody, but it has to be someone trustworthy and someone that could, br that is wealthy enough to bribe themselves out of a sticky situation if, if and when caught with the possession of something. And so, and so there's these amazing kind of, um, uh, borrowing network, overlapping borrowing networks that people have described to me where if um, I have episodes one through five of or Winter Sonata or whatever, and you have episode six through ten, and she has episode 11 through 15, I don't even know if it goes up to episode 15, but you know, uh, so on and so forth, um, we we figure out a schedule where we have to, and, and, and the, I also possess different types of dramas, we we kind of, through these shared networks, figure out a collective sketch, shared schedule where we have to watch a, on a certain date and then we rotate. And then, uh, so, some, so this is anecdotal, I can't, there's no way I can prove this, but some people have, young people, who, especially who are in the business, who have been in the business of smuggling, distributing and all this, tell me there's probably more material in circulation amongst trusted networks than in the markets because people now copy. They, they um, copy and then become either distri distributors themselves or, um, or loan them. They make a small business out of almost having a private library of um, bootleg dramas and TV shows. Sure. And so the, the, the trust-based circulation um, in addition, and loaning in addition to selling is, is, plays a tremendous role in um, just increasing the number of eyeballs that are exposed to this type of sure. uh, content. Another aspect of that adaptability uh, that you've uh, spoken to is the 
uh, rapidity with which programs make their way uh, into North Korea and are distributed that uh, the latest episode of a drama can appear in Seoul and within 24 hours right. can be out and about on the street in North Korea. It is phenomenal. So I, when, I, when I speak with people who defected maybe, let's say, early 2000s and people who have, um, who have watched foreign, con foreign media, they'll say, oh yeah, you know, I kind of figured out that you know, the, the film that I saw in 2000, I realized was really hot in South Korea in maybe the mid-90s or something like this. So it took a couple years for, um, South, for popular content from outside, especially South Korea, to get into North Korea. But now, because the demand is growing inside, and oftentimes the smugglers, the, the middlemen, it, this is a business for them. The NGOs that are pushing content into North Korea, many of them are, um, you know, they're, they're ideals driven. And so they're... They're doing this out of goodwill and all this stuff. But the people, many of the people who are the smugglers taking that content from NGOs from South Korea or elsewhere into North Korea, it's a business for them. They're taking a huge risk, but also are taking um, a big, nice commission to do this work. And so these smuggling networks getting information into North Korea as well as out of North Korea has become so sophisticated relatively that now when I speak to people who have escaped relatively um, earlier, or relatively um, recently, tell me that um, they, the brokers will then text, brokers will text what is in demand in the local area to an NGO in Seoul using you know, different um, text, mess text messaging apps, maybe Kakao or WeChat or whatever else, um, and then the NGOs will know uh, very specifically, what is in demand in the, a very specific part of North Korea? I didn't believe this, and so I thought that's kind of that sounds really that sounds too good to be true. And so, um, and so, one of the representatives from a small organization called No Chain, he said, "Oh, fine, let me show you." So he showed me in his cacao um, that like the different types of demands coming in from the middlemen brokers, uh, usually men, um, sending him very specific requests. Like what is in demand these days? Is episodes XYZ or this movie? People are hearing that this is really hot in the US or South Korea or China. Um, so it's, uh, it's, it's sophisticated in, in various ways. Um, but yeah, the, the distribution networks are increasingly becoming better. Uh, with with the technologies available, and of course, the North Korean government they're they're aware of this. Everything I'm saying here and that we're going to discuss is publicly available information, and so I think part of the reason why these um, the information, the content, the distribution, all that's becoming more innovative and crafty and creative, is that the authorities are clamping down so hard, much just much harder, and also in a much more clever way, increasingly. And so it's this constant cat and mouse game between the authorities and the consumers of information, trying to constantly outsmart each other, outpunish each other, out, you know, whatever. Um, and it's really having a positive, I mean, I don't know if positive externality is uh, the right way to describe it, but it is really forcing and compelling outside actors to become smarter in how they push content in. And now it's becoming, it's um, helping with uh, rapidity, like you said. Is there an element uh, that you've heard of in terms of uh, government or state security that actually enjoys access to these resources? I mean, the tendency in the former Soviet Union and in other places with autocratic regimes were to turn the other eye at certain points. And you've right. mentioned bribery can be persuasive. But uh, also, if one is a consumer, maybe a little more available content might be interesting when one finishes one's shift. Right, and so with the authority, there's a, there's a man in the book called Kim Hong Gwang, and m many of you may know him. He was, in addition to being a computer science professor, he also was an inspector. So he, so in addition to teaching, he went around doing the the random door to door um, checks uh, at random times. So basically, he and his colleagues, and this was a common common way to clamp down on this activity, where. Uh, an apartment building or a small village uh, or a small kind of area would have the electricity shut off right around the time people thought, the authorities thought people were watching. This is during the, when DVDs were really popular. 
shut off the electricity, and then they'll go door to door saying, you know, we need to steer a DVD machine. Um, and then someone will come and unscrew the thing, unscrew the the, the machine, take the the DVD out. The point there being, if the electricity is shut and people are pounding on the doors, you can't press eject. And there's little time to destroy the DVD machine or whatnot. So then the inspector, so in this case, Mr. Kim and his colleagues would take the DVD, go to their office, watch it to see if it has foreign content. And if it did, come back and sentence whatever punishment, whether it's big fines or you know, wink and a nod and a bribe and take that DVD so they can maybe watch it themselves or sell it and make more money off of it. Or uh, if they're, um, or harsher punishments. And so, and that's partly why USBs became more popular, because you can just pop that out when there's no electricity. Um, but he is from, um, so he left a long time ago, but when I, listen, when I talk to people who are more recent defectors, but also did similar inspection work and were author, uh, in authority positions, like local authority positions, they said, it's, your job is your job, and you may really believe in um, the principles behind information purity and all that, but then you are, at the end of the day, you are also human. You want to be entertained. And um, taking a bribe to benefit you uh, and maybe your family and then giving that confiscated goods to your wife to then <laughs> sell on the market so you have more money, um, that's a very, very common, um, a, a common way to sort of keep this phenomenon going. Um, so it's it's mutually beneficial in some ways. This also that that kind of speaks to the larger phenomenon of this kind of explosion of corruption um, across North Korea. Sure, I have two final questions for you, and then we'll turn to the audience. Uh, one is on the issue of radio, which you've mentioned. So so on a technological basis, perhaps the simplest of the items we've talked about, yet one that has been pervasive certainly during the Cold War. And if we look at what happened in Washington in the spring between the actions of Congress, between the presidential order, uh, one of the end results seems to be an intent to increase funding for radio broadcast. Uh, we've seen the BBC increase its broadcast into North Korea. Uh, do you have a sense on the efficacy of radio and how it is being accessed uh, more widely by North Korea? Sure. So I've looked, I've talked to a lot of people in um, South Korean government, obviously that's a huge body, but individuals who ha whose job was to interview defectors for a long period of time with the government. So these are people who have access to thousands of personal interviews of defectors. And I asked them this question, what are, the correlation, what are some of the loose correlations you've come across between people who access certain types of uh, information or certain modes of informa foreign information before coming to North Korea and sort of, and then kind of different opinions. Ge the general correlation that I have observed from the secondary sources, people who have been interviewed defectors, um, is that people who tend to listen to radio um, are people who are a little bit further away from the state in their, in their mind because radio tends to, the radio programs tend to transmit programs that the North Korean government sees to be much more subversive, political news, interviews, things like this. Um, and, and you can shut it off, turn it off, you know, so, so people can consume a lot more of it uh, if they're able to take the kind of necessary precautions. And so if someone is willing, to, knowingly and willingly listens to more political content, that means they're, they're, they're much more further away from the state. So that's something, I think that's partly, it partly speaks to the efficacy of radio programs, the content that's being pushed in. Also the variety of radio programs. Some are not that serious. Some are just a lot of cultural, fun, lighthearted content and that's, that kind of diversifies the, the, the listenership. So I think radio is an incredible way to, uh, to get foreign governments and also just other private entities involved uh, to, to increase the quality and content, the quality and, quanti quality and quantity of information pushed into North Korea. I think BBC having rolled out their new program, one of the largest increases of the world service since I think the 1940s, including the Korean content, is one of the best news that I think anyone in this field has heard in a while. Yeah, fascinating, fascinating. Jun, the last question for you is that, you know, the subtitle is how the information underground is transforming a closed society. 
What do you think then is the end result? Will there be rest of elements that rise in North Korea because of this information flow? Uh, is there enough social cohesiveness to, I dare say, form opposition based on the access to this information? Uh, and then secondly, how do you see it informing us in terms of our understanding of how we view North Korean and Northern Koreans and their thirst for information uh, in this day and age? Sure. So I think that foreign access to foreign information, so access to unauthorized information in this country, is a necessary but certainly not a sufficient condition to kind of quickly change this country from inside out. Um, I think that the benefit and the power of having access to information for individuals inside North Korea is for them, it, on an individual level, to have an experience cognitive dissonance. Uh, there's different worlds colliding in their mind. It's not as simple as watching a movie in the wine to the fact that, from my experience, I think no one has said that happens. Not, not a, it's not a single thing that leads someone to just risk everything and defect or change their life. But I think having repeated access to different types of information um, forces people to rethink how what their government is. You know, who, what 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 kind of world they're living in, and I think that that uh, will enable increasing amounts of autonomous thinking, critical thinking um, at a very individual level, um, which is taking place now. And I hopefully, in due time, that'll then start to increase social cohesion uh, and, um, and create enough pressures, endogenous pressures from within, to uh, force the North Korean government to rethink some of its priorities uh, domestically and internationally. But I don't think that information alone is going to enable some or trigger some Pyongyang Spring. That I, I don't. I, I'm, I, I hedge against that type of big um, claim. Uh, but yeah, necessary, but not a sufficient condition for a huge kind of regime uh, um, regime evolution. Uh, in terms of how the outside world can understand uh, North Koreans through this phenomenon, I think it really underscores a very um, basic but not a, a basic point that's not made um, uh, sufficiently, which is that North Korean people are truly just people. And I think that oftentimes uh, a lot of media coverage sort of glor either glorifies or kind of really exaggerates um, individuals from North Korea. You know, they're either like robotic, you know, crazy, brainwashed people, or um, or they're these kind of desperate souls that are ready to kind of um, like eat each other out of desperate, uh, these kind of these, like, crazy stories um, that, of course, that's, you know, that's, that's different incentives, different interests. But I think that at the core of it, North Koreans, um, they are just like us, where everyone wants to learn what they don't know. They want, they have a thirst to um, improve, improve their livelihoods uh, at an individual level and a family level, and if that means learning a little bit more about how to run their own private business on the markets by listening to some radio programs that they can sort of pick up tips to increase profit margins, um, or whether it's to um, wh whether it's to want to look like people who are more attractive and you know, like the actresses and actors and the movies, whatever it is, I think at the fundamental level, we just have to realize that these are just people who are trying to make their lives a little bit better, whether it's whether they decide to stay in North Korea or um, find a home somewhere else. Well, thank you. That's a very positive and humanizing message. And um, I'm an afraid I'm going to have to draw it to a close in the interest of leaving time for people to visit with you one on one, but also to purchase your book in sure. the lobby uh, and that you are available to sign that four people. Sure. Uh, and I wanted to point out a few words of thanks uh, as well as uh, to June for her efforts, not only with the book, for, for making our closeout of our policy season so interesting this evening. Uh, I wanted to thank Nikita Desai of our policy division as well as Peter Stemke who does all of the great audio and video for the society and is responsible for those great uh, audio podcasts that you can find for free online. So please, if you've liked this program, pass it along, distribute it, and encourage others to listen, because I think your message is a very powerful one. 
I also, just in closing, wanted to point out that we will reconvene here in the spring, and I wanted to invite you to uh, a couple of programs. One is on January 19th, economic forecasting. On February 2nd, political security forecasting, which will feature Sumi Terry as well as Sean King of Park Strategies, who's with us here this evening. And then back on uh, March uh, 6th, we will have John Park, also affiliated with Belfer at Harvard, and who lectures at the Kennedy School, who will address uh, China-Korea relations with a special eye to North Korea sanctions, etc. So uh, we have kind of a great flow here, and, and you've been an integral part of that. We've had a fascinating week. We started last Monday with uh, Kyung A. Park from the University of British Columbia. We had Victor Cha in, and Robert Gallucci, as we've mentioned, and we had James Church in, and, and now you. So we seem to have an inordinate number of books to close out our season. But this is an important one, so please purchase it. Uh, please uh, have it signed. It's great holiday giving. And I wanted to give you the chance for a last word before we sure. offer you a round of applause. Yes, and so uh, I do want to note that um, if there are any book profits that come out of this uh, this project, if there are proceeds, um, I will donate them to organization, small organizations that send information into North Korea. And so, um, so keeping that in mind, please... Um, purchase a copy or two for your family and friends. A lot of the people who are in the book, uh, many of their names are not changed. It's the names that they use publicly when they go uh, speak or you know, do whatever public engagement. So you will. Um, so, so these are people who are um, alive and well and really active in different in different networks. So, so I hope you enjoy um, not only the stories but. Um, the, a lot of the, um, the themes that arise uh, from the book. Resilience, power of information, media, and, and, um, and, uh, and just human goodwill. Thank so, you. Thank Ms. you, everyone. Ms. Beck will sign in the lobby. And a round of applause, please. For thank, you. Thank, you. thank you. Thank you so much. Happy holidays, everyone.